we read in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to eternal life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. In other words, the resurrection of the, of the dead and judgment. Looking, of course, at the second coming. So there in chapter 12, verse 2, you've got the second coming. And when you go on in the chapter, you get the talk of times, uh, of a time, times and half a time um, in verse 7, which is the traditional way of talking about the length of the tribulation period. So what you have obviously got in this chapter is the second coming in verse 2 and the tribulation in verse 7. From which it is deduced that the second coming comes before the tribulation and indeed was in AD 70. Listen. A text without a context is a pretext. A text without a context is a pretext. And as verse 2 is being used to say that the second coming has happened and indeed happens before the great tribulation is is the fault of Stephen Langton Archbishop of Canterbury in the 13th century. You say, huh? Yeah. He divided the chapters wrongly. He shouldn't have divided the chapter where he did. He should have divided it after verse 3. Look, when, when I was hearing from more than one angle that the preterists were using this passage in this way to say that the second coming had already happened, I looked at it <laughs> and I said, what on earth is going on here? So I looked. I looked at my commentaries. I've got a commentary on Daniel from a great old uh, millennial guy, E.J. Young, great Old Testament scholar. I've got, I've got a more modern commentary that the Southern Baptists put out from a totally different perspective by Miller. I looked at another commentary. I looked at two Bible commentaries, uh, one volume Bible commentaries. I looked at more than one, refer, uh, one study Bible. And they all, all of them said, from chapter 10 verse 1 to chapter 12 verse 3, is Daniel's last vision. Verse 2 is not part of the same passage as the talk about the tribulation. Verse 2 is about one thing 
And from verse 4 or verse 5, they, they differ. From verse 4 or verse 5 is instructions to Daniel wrapping up the writing of the book. And to take verse 2 and deduce that the second coming happened or happens before the tribulation and indeed in AD 70 is lousy, careless exegesis of the word of God. Did I say that strongly enough? It is a text without its context. All right. What we find what we find is that as as we talk with those leaning in this direction almost whatever passage you turn to and say well, here it is. It's, it, this is straight talk. The reaction is, oh no, you have to spiritualize that. Now listen, if anybody says to you, what the Bible says is not what it means. Wave a red flag. But this tendency to spiritualize everything that they, dis that they have to disagree with is something we have to deal with as we confront the error. And I came to the conclusion that the passage that you've got in that little pamphlet, whatever, the passage that talks about groaning is, i uh, put it like this. If I talk to you about the Holocaust, and if you've, if you've been to Jerusalem, I hope you have been to Yad Vashem and the Holocaust Memorial presentation. Groaning. Groaning. You can't spiritualize groaning. And so, we look at chapter 8 of Romans and the passage there starting in verse 17. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, seeing that we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage of corruption into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation 
has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Not only that, but we ourselves who have the first spirit, who have the spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now, in this hope, we were saved. Yet hope, which is seen, is not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly await it with patience. There are some, a number of things we need to see in this passage. The first thing is that Paul talks about the times. In verse 18, he writes about this present time. And as he is looking at this present time, he also has an eye on a future time as well. So he's looking at the present time with its difficulties and the fulfillment of the hope that we have. So the first thing you have is the times. The second thing is that you see that the creation was subjected to futility. The creation was subjected to futility. Verse 20, God subjected it to futility. And Paul, of course, is looking back to the first chapters of Genesis. Verdict in Genesis 1, after the days of creation, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. Evening came and then morning, the sixth day. God created a physical world with physical bodies for the animal kingdom, and the human race. There have been those at various times who have seen the body as bad, as evil. They've denied that Christ had a physical body, that he did in fact come in the flesh. Look at First John verse 2. They spiritualized his body. Anyway, the creation was subjected to futility. God made it good, but then came sin and punishment, part of which God subjected to the creation to futility. To the woman, I will intensify your labor pain. Your desire will be for your husband. He will rule over you. To Adam, because you listen to your wife's voice and ate from the tree about which I've commanded you, do not eat from it. The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor. All the days of your life it will produce thorns and thistles for you. You will eat the plants of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you do return to the ground. For you were taken from it, you are dust, and you will return to dust. The creation subjected to futility. Pain. Laborious work. Frustration from weeds. Death. Look round you and you see the modern equivalents. Add in cancer. 300 a week dying of opioid drugs. The number of abortions way above that. Corruption. Corruption in high places. Can you imagine a governor of a state 
and the legislative body of a state essentially saying that after a baby is born, it is okay to kill it. It is not murder. Chicago. Spending three trillion on health care. Creation. Groaning. The groaning is real. Creation, verse 21, needs to be set free from its slavery to corruption. Verse 22, the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pain until now. So first, the times, the present time, and the future. Creation subjected to futility in the present time, and in the present time also, sons waiting for adoption. Verse 23, not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. The fallen creation groans and the sons of God groan. As we're in the fallen creation, our bodies affected by the fall. But the next thing we see is that God's sons are going to be revealed. Verse 19 in Romans 8, For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. church without babies is dead <laughs> and when they're taken out if they cry that's wonderful I'm serious we love the fact that we have babies and babies and babies and uh, we all try and help one another the creation waits for God's sons to be revealed. Verse 23, it's called the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. And as Paul looks at the future for the Christian, it, he finds it hard to talk about it without using the word glory. Look at it. Romans 8, 17, we suffer with him so that we may be glorified with him. I consider, verse 18, the sufferings of this present time aren't worth comparing with the glory that's going to be revealed to us. The creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed, for the creation was subjected to futility in the hope that the creation itself will be set free from the bondage of corruption into the glorious freedom of the children of God. He's tying it together. He's saying, the creation is groaning, we're groaning, groaning. And we are looking for our redemption, our being set free. And that is tied up with the creation itself being set free. Paul seems to be saying that it's only when the sons of God are revealed in their glory that creation can be set free. The creation, verse 19, eagerly awaits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed, for the creation was subjected to futility in hope that the creation will be set free from the bondage of corruption into the glorious freedom of God's children. Looking at a few other passages, start of Revelation 21, you see the new heaven and the new earth, 
And in that situation, God dwells with his people, verse 3. And verse 4, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will no longer exist. Grief, crying, and pain will exist no longer because the former things have passed away. The groaning of creation will have finished. Then the passage that Dean read for us, 1 John 3, look how great a love the Father's given us that we should be called God's children, and we are. The reason the world doesn't know us is it didn't know Him. Dear friends, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. What we will be has not yet been revealed, but... We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. John says he, Jesus, is going to appear. We will see him and that will transform us. We will look like children of God. Can you imagine this whole bunch transformed? Glorified. All right. You have to put together 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4. You have to put them together because they complement each other. Paul talking on two different occasions for two different reasons about the Lord's coming. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 49. Just as we have borne the image of the man made of dust, we will bear the image of the heavenly man. We will look like children of God. Brothers, I tell you this, verse 50, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Corruption cannot inherit incorruption. And then in 1 Thessalonians 4, where this fits in, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord, the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. When we see the Lord face to face, the change takes place in us. Going back to 1 Corinthians 15. Listen, I'm telling you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep. We won't all die, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the blink of an eye, at the last trumpet. Thessalonians mentioned the trumpet with Christ's call. The trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed. We will be changed in a moment, in the blink of an eye at the last trumpet. We will be changed. This corruptible body must be clothed with incorruptibility. This mortal must be clothed with immortality. Putting all this together, Truths to hold. Creation was cursed because of man's sin. It groans. It longs to be set free. The children of God currently groan and look like ordinary people. 
when Christ appears, we will be like him. Our bodies will be changed. Your body's not perfect. It will be. Do you hear that? Your body is not perfect. But it will be. When that happens, creation will be set free. In the new creation, there's no groaning. But now, in this present time, creation is still subject to futility. Creation is now still groaning. Christians who have the first fruits of the Spirit are still groaning. Did you know that more Christians were martyred in the 20th century than in all previous centuries? Why? Why? There are young idiots going round wanting socialism. It was socialism that led to so many thousands of the martyrs. We have hospitals. with groaning. We have nursing homes. We have funeral directors. The sufferings of this present time are still with us. If 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 the second coming happened in A.D. 70, so did the perfection of your body. The sufferings of this present time still with us we don't radiate the glory of the children of God but this crucial conclusion here the second coming of Christ cannot be separated from the glorification of Christians when he appears, we will be like him. For we shall see him face to face. At the last trumpet, in a moment, at the twinkling of an eye, we shall all be changed. The second coming of Christ cannot be separated from the glorification of Christians and the end of groaning. Look. The groaning is still there. If I said it was not, all the mothers present would stone me. 
the second coming of Christ cannot be separated by one minute. The second coming of Christ cannot be separated from the glorification of Christians. From your getting your resurrection body and the ending of all the groaning. Not that that will be what strikes you. It will be the wonder of the presence of the Savior. We are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that he appears. When he appears, we will be like him because we'll see him as he is. The Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Listen, I'm telling you a mystery. We will not all sleep. We will all be changed in a moment in the blink of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. <laughs> Who wants to throw that away and spiritualize it? <laughs> Friends, the Lord is going to come. Every eye will see him. When he appears... We will be like him because we see him as he is. And it will be a glorious, glorious day. The alternative we are offered is it's all happened and this world is just going to go on and on and on. <laughs> Who on earth wants that? <coughs> the Lord has something better for us. The creation has been subjected to futility in hope because God's plan is that the creation will be set free from its bondage to decay as Christ comes, as we are transformed. And that is what is going to come about. There's a, there's a hymn that starts, Lo, he comes with clouds descending. Lo, the one for sinners slain. And it goes on and talks about how, how wonderful it will be for God's people on that day. And then it goes to another verse and it again focuses on Christ descending and the reaction of others. Deeply wailing. Deeply wailing. is how they see the Messiah. It's either going to be the most wonderful day of your life or the most terrible. Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. I'll give you rest for your souls. Paul, in Athens, God commands all men to repent. Paul to the Philippians jailer. He said, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. 
Let's pray.